you're looking live at a snowy Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City, Missouri. Tribute to uh, Brent Musburger calling his last game today uh, at the Oakland Coliseum. But uh, no, you're at face. Uh, you're at Facebook Live Red Zone Extra here at the Arrowhead Stadium press box where it's warm in here. But man, if you were sitting outside today, God bless you. <laughs> bless you. I, I've never seen as much snow in a fall during a day, not just a game, but a day in Kansas City as we saw today. So we're going to talk about that, the Chiefs win over the Denver Broncos with Sam McDowell, Herbie Teope, Sam Mellinger, and Vahe Gregorian will be with us whenever Vahe shows up. It's, we, he's on Vahe time. No promises. <laughs> <laughs> no promises indeed. So. 23-3, the Chiefs beat the Broncos. They had already clinched the division the previous week. So um, there was a, I guess there was a chance for a little bit of a letdown with the post-Patriots victory. It certainly bit the Houston Texans the previous week. But no such letdown today, Herbie. Yeah, and then leading up to this game, a lot of players I spoke to in the locker room this past week have all said the same thing. They were fully aware of what happened to the Texans and that letdown, and they were, they emphatically said this is not going to happen to us. And they came out here and basically they punched the Denver Broncos in the mouth. To me, what was so impressive about this game was given the snowy conditions, usually you think immediately run heavy game. Not with the Chiefs today. Patrick Mahomes, 340 yards passing, two touchdowns in blizzard-like conditions. And the Chiefs really made a statement that we're rolling into the postseason here. And you got another strong defensive showing held the Broncos to three points, and to me, it was a very fantastic game overall for the Chiefs. Heck yeah, it was. Hey, uh, let us know uh, what you want to talk about. Questions, comments here uh, through Facebook Live. Jason says he can't hear us. I'm hoping that, uh, okay, Beth gives us a thumb, thumbs up that we're good on sound. So, if it's yeah. just Herbie drowned out, I think we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hey, thanks, Bradley. Appreciate the uh, the info. So, um, yeah, send us your questions, comments. We'll get to as many of them as we can. What did you guys think driving in today and how the game would unfold because of the weather? Well, I was a little frustrated by the condition of the roads <laughs> this morning. <laughs> it didn't seem like the roads near my place had been treated because I live on the poor Missouri side. I know all you guys are on the Kansas side. Um, but... I definitely, certainly, to echo what Herbie said, thought that it would affect the passing game more than it did. Mahomes said something interesting in his press conference, though, that uh, he thought the first time he played in snow, which was last year against the Colts in the playoffs, he expected the ball to be slick, but it actually created like a sticky feeling for him. So he actually thought he was able to throw the ball, grip it a little bit better, um, which is unusual. So he said coming into today, he remembered that performance last year and was pretty confident coming in. Harrison Bucker said the same thing, you know, he, that uh, having the experience of playing the Colts in the playoff last year helped them be ready for today. And he said the other key for him, he hit three field goals, uh, including a 44-yarder the last play of the, of the first half, was the fact that they played in conditions in which they warmed up in. The conditions didn't change from warm-up to game. And he, he said that that was important for, uh, for him. Scooter, how you doing, man? Good to hear from you. Um, Sam, what would you think? I... Look, you, you were the last one here, so you you saw the city more covered in snow than any of us. I was passed down, is it Little Blue Parkway or Swope Parkway or whatever. Um, I was passed by a car whose back wheels were locked, and it was he was just sliding Good. down the road. And that guy <laughs> passed me. I hear this honk, 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 and I'm like, oh, okay. Let me get over. Just switch lanes here real quick. Um, I mean, I was going, you know, we have four-wheel drive, I was going 25 miles an hour at the most. I, it was um, – the, the difference – and when I was leaving, um, one of my kids was like, they're going to play in the snow. Like, this is amazing. I was like, there's not going to be snow on the field, you know, because <laughs> they got a heated field. It melts all the snow. It's like a buzzkill, you know. And there was snow. Like, they, they couldn't keep it off. And and the snowflakes are the size of freaking Frisbees, you know. Um, so you, you understand why the field kind of got overwhelmed. The, the difference – I guess the thing that I was the most surprised about about the actual football was you can throw in the snow. Like, you, you can throw in weather. But a lot of times I feel like it's, it's short stuff, you know. Yep. And, and Mahomes was throwing the ball like it was 70 degrees and we were in 
LA, you know, like mm -hmm. th there was no, the degree of difficulty throws, he was still doing that, that one that was off this back foot that still had the velocity yeah. uh, to Hardman, Hardman yeah. on, on that out route, um, Great obviously throw. threw a ton to, to Kelsey. Um, you know, it, it, it just didn't seem like they adjusted at all for the weather, which if it didn't work out, we'd be wondering why they <laughs> didn't. Right. But it, it, he just cut through it. It was amazing. I've yeah. never seen, I've never seen that before. Uh, hey to Kathy and uh, and Kyle Coffey says sharpest Pat in the offensive looked at a, in a long time. I think he's right. You know, at yep. least in the last month. And this they've won four in a row. And the first game back from the injury was the Tennessee game, which they lost. And he was good that day with 440 passing yards. But the next three games, there was just something out of sync. And we Andy hates that word for some reason. Andy Reid out of sync. Don't tell him the offense is out of sync because he he won't buy it. But that's what it was. There was something with this offense. And we, we had some we, – Pat addressed it this week, uh, you know, kind of happy feet and backpedaling mm -hmm. out of trouble, that sort of thing. He stayed in the pocket more today, and I thought it was reflected in his numbers in his game. 27 of 34 in the snow. It's like 80% almost, 79.4, yeah. something like that. But we saw it, like, right away, too. That throw to Tyreek on the, the, you know, the first touchdown of the game, he stepped into yeah. – up in, in the, into the pocket and into pressure, which he's done even during these, like, quote unquote struggles and like Patrick Mahomes is having the second best season that a quarterback has ever had for the Chiefs but even in these like quote unquote struggles um, that he's done that sometimes but not consistently and I don't remember I, I, watching live I thought there was one time he bailed a clean pocket but um, I think it was Ryder got beat on on a stunt on the inside I, I don't I don't know that he bailed the pocket one time uh, when, when he didn't need to. It was just it was just a remarkable difference from, from what we've seen the last few weeks. Uh, and I, I thought another key today for his success were his, there weren't drops uh, yeah. today. Receivers were holding on to the ball and um, uh, everybody. And the biggest target of the day and the happiest person among our coverage team is sitting to my immediate right because he had the story <laughs> already written before the game. And that's... Uh, Travis Kelsey had a great game, didn't he? Had it written before last week's game, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kelsey, uh, wow, 142 yards receiving. He ended his game needing just 11 yards to record a fourth straight 1,000-yard receiving t uh, season for a tight end, which is a record. And then on top of that, he set another record for the most receiving yards uh, for a player, uh, for a tight end through his first seven seasons. A historic day for, for Travis Kelsey, for sure. And he had a monster game, 11 catches, 142 yards on 13 targets. That, 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 that's a lot. And I know you, you found a statistic, Sam, that you sent to me that day. Yeah, let me... Uh, you, got, you got to pull that up. Let me make sure I get this right. It is... Um, I, I, pro Football Reference, they have this play index where you can look up yeah. all kinds of... It's not quite Elias Sports Bureau, but it's the, it's the closest good, thing though. I have. Um, all right, 11 catches, 142 yards. In the last 10 seasons, that's as far back as I went, a tight end has matched those numbers just six times. Kelsey is three of them. <laughs> And, and, and the other three, it was, if I remember right, it was Witten, Tony Gonzalez, and I think Zach Ertz. Hmm. That's it. Uh, the Broncos played into the Chiefs' hands, I thought, today. And Fangio got into a, somebody asked him a little bit about their defensive scheme after the game, and uh, he didn't expand on it a lot. But they tried to take away Tyreek Hill today by doubling him and just one-on-one -on -one with Travis Kelsey. And I'm, I don't know why you would leave Travis Kelsey one-on-one -on -one <laughs> because the Chiefs are going to go to him constantly but especially in the snow, to try and take away the deep threat was bizarre to me. And, and by the way, it didn't work because Tyree Kill still scored on, on the first drive right. of the game and had two touchdowns in the game. But um, to me, I don't think it's a, a real sound defensive strategy to, to leave Travis Kelsey one-on-one. -on -one. And the, the Chiefs exploited it four quarters. The, the way it was explained to me by a couple different people was that it wasn't necessarily like doubling Tyreek as much as playing a lot of zone and cheating to that side, which leaves yeah. Yeah. Kelsey kind of, you know, one-on-one uh, -on, -one on the backside. And I, I, I feel like it's, it's almost just written in their playbook. If you see Kelsey one-on-one -on -one with no help, that's where you throw the ball. That's where it's going. I mean, yeah. that's what, yeah, that, that's the recognition. So Chris Hill wants to know if um, – Field goals in the red zone are still a concern. Yeah, they got to the five twice in the first half and settled for field goals. How much did the weather play into that though today? Also penalties, and that's that's the thing that that's sort of been killing them in the red zone. Uh, I'd still like to see the replay because we never got a good look at the Darwin Thompson blindside block that took him out of the red zone. 
late in the first half. Right. Um, but that obviously killed one of their drives. But, yeah, I mean, I think it's a concern because it's a trend. It wasn't just today that we've seen that. We've seen that throughout the whole season, and usually it's penalty inflicted. I gave him a little bit of a pass for the red zone issue today just because jet sweep type plays weren't available to the Chiefs. And that's always an option for them at the five. It's why I turned to you a couple times when the Chiefs got to the 20, and I'm thinking, score here. Because it's easier for the Chiefs to score from the 25 than it is from yeah, the five sometimes, right. it yeah. seems to me. Because um, once they get to the, you know, once they get to the 10 and the five, it's, you know, they just, they were, they came into this weekend 21st in the NFL in, in red zone touchdown percentage. 53%, 53%, right? 53%, yep. and they were first or second in the NFL with that last year. Yeah. So They were one of four today. Is that what it ended up being, one, one of four? four? The, yeah, that's right, because the, yeah. the short touchdown pass to Tyreek Hill. Yeah. How big of a concern would that be? I think it's a concern because I – and it makes it makes sense that um, as the field shrinks, their speed matters less. So th that's sure. a problem. And as the field shrinks, their inability to run the ball, especially Bingo. up the middle, matters more. Um, it's – it's I don't know how it's not a concern. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's it's – it's a better concern than the one would be like, how can we never get to the red zone? You know, like we can never get, you know, never get in those opportunities. So it's, it's a better problem than that. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's a scoring league and, you know, no matter how much the defense has been improved to beat the best teams, I think you need seven instead of three a lot. Uh, Paul Arrowwood said that uh, Darwin Thompson's penalty was real. I, I, I saw it. You, on the replay, you could see it at the very top, top of the screen, of the screen yep. and you could see a Bronco player flying, you know, yeah. his, what a, what a silly thing. And maybe chalk that up to maybe a rookie mistake and not knowing sort of time and space. And that, But that it did. It wiped out a big play, big 30-yard gain for Kelsey. And it's ironic because we've been thinking he's not getting more on the field because he's not blocking. And then he gets called for a blindside block, <laughs> where apparently, apparently, uh, according to Paul here, he laid somebody out. So yeah. um, I'm sure the Chiefs would love to see more of that at the line of scrimmage. Um, so that's what happened on the offensive side, mostly today. I thought the Chiefs actually ran the ball effectively. They they picked Spencer Ware picked okay. up some first downs at the end. Look, it, the, the Broncos were not going to be part of this game in the second. Once the Chiefs scored that second touchdown, um, the first one in the second half, that was kind of it, I think, for the for for the Broncos. And but Chiefs defense played terrific all day, all day again, for sure. And um, I don't. I, Drew Locke came here, and I've been, I was on a couple of Denver radio stations this week and uh, kind of saying, look, we're small town enough in Kansas City to all be happy for Drew Locke. And, you know, really cool that a local high school product who went to Mizzou is having this kind of, was off to this kind of start in the NFL. And Chiefs fans probably wish he was in a different division, you know, and because so they don't have to see him twice. But, he didn't have much of a chance today, did he? I mean, he it was just the conditions were bad. The defense he was facing was really good. And um, it was from the get-go, from the outset, he just was not – he wasn't effective, was he? Yeah, it's, it's something that we – I know you touched on when you previewed this game, and I also mentioned it as well. The, the last two games that the, the Broncos won came against the Chargers, and, of course, they ambushed the Texans that just completely flat. He hadn't faced this kind of a defense – so far in his young NFL career. And to give you an idea of what the Chiefs defense is doing now, in the past four games, this is the fourth straight game they have allowed 17 points or less. And in two of those games, 10 points or less. They've outscored the Broncos now 53-9 to nine in the two games this year. And you want to take it a step further, because I know a lot of Chiefs fans hate the Raiders. They've outscored the Raiders 69 to, or, excuse me, 63-19 to 19 <laughs> in the last two games. So... Locke is going to have a good career. He just ran into a buzzsaw. He ran against a surging Chiefs defense, and we've talked about this over the last month at every Facebook Live event that the Chiefs defense is now coming well coming into their own. It's for real. I think it's a bad matchup for Drew Locke as a rookie because the Texans last week played almost exclusively man-to-man. -man. They didn't give him a lot of versatile looks. The Chiefs give teams a lot of different looks, and for a guy that's only playing in his third NFL game, I think that's a tough assignment. Um, but, uh, you know, he threw one touchdown ball, I thought, to Corlin Sutton. And the, was that late in the first quarter that Tyron Matthew just completely That's ripped out of his hands? Yes. On a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, what a great play. Great yeah. play. That, that was a great a back ball. That was a great ball. Yeah. That was and a back it, shoulder It was a really good and throw. And nine times out of ten you throw that ball, that should be a touchdown to your top wide receiver. However, he threw a ball that Tyron Matthew didn't have to make any play on. And then they called it a flag, and then he threw a ball that Juan Thornhill didn't have to make any any play on. So I, I think right now as a rookie, and we, heck, we saw a lot of that at Mizzou. 
where <laughs> he's got the arm to make any, any play he wants. It's about making the right decision a lot of times. And those are the things that it's just going to take time with him. I, 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 did, I will say the Chiefs players were impressed with, with Drew Locke today. Even Tyron Matthew, unprompted by a question, said he's got an arm and he's confident. He said you can tell by the way he carries himself that he's confident in his throws and that that, that stuff goes a long way in the NFL. Coleman, I did say the Chiefs' uh, defense was really good, um, and I, I'm standing by it. I'm standing by my declaration that the Chiefs' defense is really good. I mean, it has been for the last for the last month. Well, you wrote about the safeties. Um, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, Thornhill and, and Matthew. To, to me, that's what's changed the defense. There's a there's a lot of elements that, that's better than it was last year, but I think they've changed the, the defense more often than anything. Um, which, which I mean, Sam predicted in the preseason that they were going to help the cornerbacks out because they were different, but. Um, Thornhill said that they're now even competing with each other over how many, who makes more plays throughout a game. And I think the way I phrased it in the story was last year you wondered, is anybody going to make a play? And now they're arguing over who's going to make more throughout the game. Um, but we all know that's the strength right now, the Chiefs defense. I'm surprised when I look at the numbers that Phillip Lindsay runs the ball seven times today. I was surprised um, by that too. 4.6 yards of carry. Uh, a couple, you know, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about Josh Jacobs not getting the ball enough. I, I don't know why teams aren't running the ball against, against the Chiefs more. And part of that is because, I mean, you look at it, the Chiefs get out to a 15-3 to halftime lead, but yep. that's still only a two-possession game. I, I, I think teams have to come in, especially when they come in here in these sort of weather conditions, have to start running the ball more. And how about on back-to-back -back plays? Teran Matthew gets an interception that's nullified yeah. because of the Charverius Ward penalty. Pat penalty. Um, I, th I think it was good. Somebody asked about the penalty. I thought it was a good call. He grabbed his jersey, and on the next play, Thornhill gets the pick. Yeah, in, yeah. In Matthew, uh, Matthew, who is like probably the most vocal guy out on the field for that defense, maybe, um, said that he didn't say anything to Juan Thornhill after the game, after that play, because he was pissed off it wasn't his interception. So. <laughs> um, and Thornhill said he made a specific point to say I stole that inter interceptions from you. Um, Jason Collinsworth with an interesting question. Is Teran Matthew better than Eric Berry in his prime? That's part one of his two-part question. He had a good, listen, Teran Matthew had a terrific game today. Really good. I, I thought really good, and he's been getting better, progressively better. But I got to tell you, 2015 Eric Berry was as good as I've ever seen that position played. Was that the, the pick two year? And the no, that Carolina? actually was the next year. Okay. The 2015 was his first year back from yeah. the uh, – uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah, I don't, 2016 I don't, was phenomenal too. Yeah, I, I don't think any of us watched a ton of Tyron Matthew closely, you know, before this season. But um, he's been terrific. Um, there's no, you know, if he gets on the Pro Bowl, he's that's well deserved, all that stuff. But uh, Eric Berry's had some years better than this, I think, and that's again no insult. Uh, Ty Tyron's been great. Eric Berry's also a two-time All-Pro, and and this is Tyron Matthew's third team, and. Usually you start wondering why are players traveling around if you're an elite player. And I'm not saying the Honey Badger isn't elite, but I don't think – I agree with Sam here. He, I don't believe he's at Eric Berry's level, and a lot of us have watched Eric Berry over the years from being around the team. I, I don't think he's at that level yet. Hey, what, though? He, the Honey Badger is the right guy for this team. Oh, my gosh. Right guy yeah. right now. For this, for this defense, yeah, too. For Absolutely. This, for, this, for this defense. And part two of Jason's question, is Travis Kelsey better than Tony Gonzalez? Hmm. I thought that I think Tony Gonzalez's threat in the red zone uh, is a weapon that Travis Kelsey isn't quite to that level of, of throw it up and go get it. He's really good after the catch, though. Are we talking Tony Gonzalez for the Falcons or Gonzalez for the team? I'm kidding. I kid. I kid. I kid. The, the, the team he loves or the team he hates? <laughs> um, how about uh, Tadishi? I hope I'm pronouncing that your name right. Um, uh, what are our thoughts on, uh, is it Damone Harris? Damone, is that how you, I yeah, don't know yeah. how he pronounces it. Um, another Veach signing looks, looks good. Harris is the, you know, the, 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 lot, the uh, defensive end that's had to play in, with Alex Okafor out. That was, that's the injury uh, news for today, Alex Okafor going down after the sack of Drew Locke. Uh, I didn't see the arm get, is that what happened? He got his arm okay. caught uh, underneath Drew Locke. So when Drew Locke rolled towards him, uh, Okafor continued to roll as well, but his arm did not. And it looked like to me that his, his 
pectoral muscle got stretched there. Yeah, um, and Andy so. Reid did say it was a pec muscle or it was a pec injury, and of course he'll get that to us yeah. on Monday. We'll see Monday. Well, I hope it's just a pec injury and not a pectoral tear. Usually but, not a great sign. Yeah, but what's, what's concerning, though, is when a player is immediately ruled out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's where you start saying, okay, this this is serious. If it's he's questionable return, and then by halftime to designate him out, then you're like, okay, maybe it's he could he could be okay. But immediately after the injury happened, he was ruled out. Yeah, Kathy Christensen said, but he got up and celebrated. We saw that, and then he went to the sideline, and they looked at him, and he went to the locker room. Yeah, uh, he wasn't he was not with the team in the second half. So, um, uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, yeah, Kathy, and you're right about um, Tyran Matthew, the, the attitude that he brings. I think that's a... They needed that. Uh, yes, I, and that's what I, I... And Frank Clark has the same stuff. Yep. You know, that same cockiness, arrogance, you know, sort of just confidence of pushing. And, and, and it, it's like a... It seems to me, anyway, it's like an inclusive trait. You know, Tyron is... is has this athletic arrogance. I can't remember what coach said that about Patrick Mahomes, but I love that term. It pains you. Um, it wasn't? Yeah, the, the first time they played. Yeah. Um, you know, has this athletic arrogance, and so does Frank Clark. But they're very—they're inclusive with it. They—they're pumping their teammates up. They're, you know, they're leading that way to make it, you know, sort of. And th that's what they were missing last year so much that, that they were wounded, mentally, emotionally. You know, that that group, especially in the secondary, those guys had no confidence. You—you you could tell during the week. You could tell after games. You know, the conversations they'd have amongst themselves. I mean, that that group was wounded, and I think Tyron has come in and, and really been a help in that way. Speaking of Clark Blair, I know you you chatted with him after the game, a, a yeah. guy that's practiced once in the last two weeks with his stomach issues. Yeah, so that was – that stomach ailment, what a sort of a mysterious um, uh, situation for him to – for all the problems that he had. You know, he told you after the Tennessee game he'd been playing with a pinched nerve in his right. neck all year. Yeah. And then he had a shoulder injury and, and then a stomach – and then a, the flu and a stomach ailment, and those two weren't necessarily related. It's just – it's one. Th it's been one thing after another for him. He's been battling through it. He was. He was really stand up. Did, did you stick around for him? Mm -hmm. So you heard him too after the game. He, I thought he was really good and spoke to. Um, you know. He, you know. Doctor said he probably shouldn't have started the season, but he got a pick in that first game, as I recall, with yeah, Jacksonville. Yeah. He got an interception, um, but he was kind of a sluggish player early on. It wasn't. You know. It's like who is. Why don't we get more? Because no, none of us at the time knew what the issue was with him. And why, why weren't the Chiefs getting more from Frank Clark? But, you know, even with the issues that he's had, he didn't have a sack today, but he had a couple of hits. I know he bothered Drew Locke once or twice. Um, and through the injuries and the issues, he's been playing pretty well here the last six weeks. I think he's got six sacks in 12 games. He missed a couple, but six sacks and disruptive. And his presence is going to be all the more important if this Okafor injury is, yeah. you know, significant. Because now we're just looking at Passigno, Frank Clark, Chris Jones probably moving from the middle to the outside, and uh, and Harris is uh, the, you know the the the, the, new, the late acquisition that they picked up off the the Ravens practice squad this week. So uh, all of a sudden, you know, without Ogba, um, the, the defensive end position depth is, is looking like a little bit of a concern. Yeah, and that's the position before the season that they had the most depth. Yeah, in, you know, and everything. Yeah. man, they might be able to trade one of those guys to get a corner. Yeah. you know, because that's where they need depth. <laughs> And, you know, Breland Speaks went down. I mean, so, there's, you know, they're potentially down three guys at that single position that, that they expected to contribute. Okay, so this question has actually been asked and answered, but I wanted to let Herbie take a stab at it. Uh oh So Chiefs-Bears, is that going to get flexed? <laughs> Chiefs-Bears will not be flexed. Uh, the NFL came out and said, staying put. Uh, there were a lot of factors at play here. You know, the Titans obviously lost to the Houston Texans, so they kind of, like, lost a little – Luster here for their game against the Saints. Uh, yeah, the Chiefs will stay on primetime TV, and we're thrilled about that. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's take a vote of those who are thrilled about that. All those who are thrilled about the Chiefs playing on primetime next Sunday night uh, signify by raising their hands. <laughs> I was ready to chronicle Sam's log of travel that day. It was gonna be great. Just, just ready to. Was be that, that was gonna be. That was gonna be my story for the day. The you going in and trip. out of Chicago, yeah. same day, covering a football game and coming back home. <laughs> Felt good, man. I was gonna get home by one, or so. One ish. Yeah. Yeah. I would have taken that. Yes. Yes. Um, so, all right. Um, what's the? 
with the results today, especially that the Titans Texans game, what's the what's the playoff scenario for the Chiefs? They're they're still the three. Nothing changed with the Chiefs. Still the three right. seed. Well, as long yeah. as the Patriots win, they're going to be stuck in right. the three, even if they keep winning. And, yeah. and you know the Bengals, right? But um, do you notice that they stopped playing highlights from the Bengals Patriots? <laughs> yeah, <when laughs> and, <laughs> so the Patriots started like rolling, yeah. rolling. Yeah, they, so they yeah, it. so there were random cheers at Arrowhead, like uh, <laughs> between plays. We're all kind of looking around. What's going on? They flashed the Bengals leading the Patriots. I think ten to seven. <laughs> yeah, at one uh, point. The the game that they might lose has always been this week, though. The well, a week from today, yeah. um, they, they play the Bills, and that one's in Foxborough. I think right? that's a Saturday in, game. Yeah, it's a Saturday game. Oh, it's, it's, a Saturday. it's in yeah. Foxborough. In Foxborough, yeah. so yeah. But we it's the it's the last best chance. The Patriots are zero and one in Foxborough in the last one game <laughs> that, that we've seen them there, right? And then and then they play the is it the Jets? The Jets. The last game yeah, of the year, yeah. so it's probably a win. Uh, Aaron Elder wanted to know the extent of Tyreek Hill's injury. Uh, what did Andy Reid say about? He, I don't think he did. He came back to play though. Yeah, he, yeah, he was back on the field. Yeah. The only two injuries that Andy real uh, Andy Hill Andy Reid addressed after the game were was Okafor's pectoral injury and also Andrew Wally suffered an ankle injury as well. But not uh, Juan Thornhill. Uh, he actually he, he went down. He gave us a scare. You know, yeah, his, his interception injury. came after his injury. His collision with uh, Charvarius Ward. Yep. Right. Right. Uh, Todd Bryan would have lost some money on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Todd, Todd Bryan uh, asked and answered, uh, Vahe Gregorian is here. Um, we are thrilled to welcome him. <laughs> <laughs> so Todd thought uh, Vahe was going to play hooky? Is that mm-hmm. He's, he actually asked that? Where's Vahe? Yeah, where's Vahe Santa? I really like that. <laughs> I didn't like the Santa part quite as much, but, it, but I, I think of it as a generosity of spirit as opposed to aging look. Uh, and I just care that you notice, Todd. Thank you. <laughs> These guys didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> Notice what? But, yeah. Oh, well, look, look Bahe's here. <laughs> uh, what'd you write? I wrote about Patrick Mahomes. I uh, found it irresistible. Um, and I, I just thought, of all the weird things, right, a guy who's been basically off kilter for a few weeks, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but finds himself in the in the snow globe. I mean, I just it just seems like kind of the latest unfolding chapter in, in how does this guy still surprise us. Um, and that, that's how I felt today. And, I, I don't know if you, I'm sure you guys already discussed Patrick, but I don't think any of us doubted that he still had the magic. I mean, it's not been anything like that, but it hasn't really been, you know, the wow factor these last couple of games. There were some nice moments against the Patriots, of course, but, but you haven't felt like the offense has been what it was or what it could be. And today you did. I know that, you know, the, the total still remains 23 points, but um, they obviously shut it down in the fourth quarter and, and just decided to grind out the clock. So I think we saw enough in the uh, just the, the sharpness, the connection, uh, the chemistry, um, the innovation that, that uh, we hadn't seen for a while, all of that. Maybe summed up a little bit in the two-point conversion in, in some ways. Yeah. yeah that we was... should credit Sam because he picked him as his rubber meets the road pick out of nowhere. <laughs> what is, right, what right is up a hat? <laughs> What is up with your rubber pick meets the road pick? You always, like, follow up with everyone after every game. Who you, was your pick? Well, I think I picked Charverius Ward this week. So. <laughs> of all the guys in the secondary, he probably had the worst Oh, and Sammy Watkins guys. a couple of weeks ago, too. Who was the correct pick for rubber meets the road today? Probably it really was Travis Kelsey, or it was Mahomes. Who, who got Kelsey the ball? <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, you know, Mahomes is going to finish with you know, um, 20, you know, touchdown pass total in the 20s, right? He's His two today give him 23 for the year, right? He missed two games, obviously, two and a half games. So, you know, statistically, it's going to look a little different than 55,000, uh, which was just, you know, just otherworldly successful. And uh, so he's going to finish with 27, 28 touchdown passes, which would probably be the third or fourth most in, Chiefs history, I guess, right? Um, and 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 clearly less than uh, he'll be somewhere over four thousand yards passing. Um, I I just think his, you know, he's not going to be the MVP of the league. Not with Lamar Jackson having the season and Russell Wilson having his season. It won't be a repeat year for Patrick Mahomes. But I, I think his, you know, his his final evaluation is going to be how far this team goes in the postseason. Is that is that fair to say? Sure. Yeah, I think that's more than fair to say because most quarterbacks are judged by championships and how far you can take your guy, your team, into, how deep you can take them into the postseason. 
Chiefs, Chiefs right now cannot be a one and done team. They just can't. I, I think if anything, it, it, it'll ruin what happened this year. I, I don't. Even though I, I'll admit, a couple of weeks ago I was telling Blair, oh, this is a one and done team. Now, were, now yeah, I don't know if that's the case now. You know, I think um, the, the win against New England kind of like turned me the other way. But Mahomes is going to be judged how far he takes his team in the postseason. He's. I think he's been better too. It, it's it's a weird thing. He was so freaking good last year. Um, I mean, like, just near perfection. Unreasonably good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no reason to expect that, and, that type and of season. I, I think that plus the injuries, not just his, like the ankle, knee, and foot, um, but the line, everything else, I, I, I think that it's created a perception that he's played, like, almost poorly or mediocre, that, that this is like, you know, Alex Smith 2.0. And it's not. I think he's been really, really good. Um, he just hasn't been, you know, he's gone from MVP to merely like a top three quarterback, something like that in the league. He shows he's human. Yeah. Right. He's showing. Right. He's showing and, he's human. Yeah. And it took a while, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it took a while to see that he was human. But, um, you know, that, and Vahe, you just referenced it, but that two point conversion play was straight out of 2018. You know, that, that was. Well, I think that that's, what he, that's what he was going for on the interception, too, one of those 2018-type yeah. plays. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was just so ill-advised because um, I, I, Kelsey was open. I saw him flash open in the if he had just tilted his head a little bit. Um, he, he'd have seen an open Kelsey. But One, one quick thing to add, Blair, to this, mm-hmm. too, and, and you guys have said it in as many words in a way, but I think one thing that accounts for the numbers, too, and it's kind of a growing phenomenon is a little strong to say, but a growing thing is – that they are starting to play a little bit more complementary football because the nature of the game yeah. is is three units and two units and the way this defense is playing, you know, it's not just simply we have to hope we score thirty five and win. It's what's the best way to win? What's the best way to sort of just reel ourselves in and, and, and stay on path? Now it doesn't mean you're not allowed to play great offense, but but I do think some of the numbers, there's a there's a definite downshift in some ways in what they're trying to do because of the defense. You're also missing your running game. I mean, well, yeah. and, and not only are you missing your running game, you're missing <clears throat> running backs that could catch out of the backfield because Kareem Hunt was very good at that, and Damian Williams is really good out of the backfield. Screen game is his game. Yeah, and he's good when they line him up on, on a linebacker as well, and he's been a non-factor this year. He's been either absent from the game or uh, overtaken by LaShawn McCoy unexpectedly early in the season um, and ineffective. And, and now, you know, we thought he might play this week, but, but missed Friday because he was sick, we were told, and out again. And I, I still think they need him back if they're going to make a deep playoff run. It's a fascinating point you bring up about the running backs out of the backfield because LaShawn McCoy historically ranks among the league leaders as one of the most versatile running backs in, in the league. And, and he hasn't been used in that capacity at all, at least Not at all. since he's been here. I haven't seen him hitting those screen games. In, when he was with Reed in Atlanta, that was their staple. Well, the one the, the one I remember uh, was against the Colts, and he ended up fumbling at the uh, you know, after a 25-yard yeah. gain or something. It was on a that was a screen. That that is where speed shows up the most when a running back, though, which is one of the reasons that Damian Williams is good in in the passing game. And speed's no longer a strength for McCoy at his age. Yeah. So, Jeremy Thompson and Brian Johnson, you both uh, were asking about Kareem Hunt. I, let's do this. Let's save that po- position breakdown or what the Chiefs have been in, at that position. We'll go into more detail on Thursday when we uh, uh, meet again on uh, Facebook Live at a Big O Tire somewhere in the, in the, in the metropolitan area. So, we are, um, we're going to wind down just because we need to go home. And um, and negotiate the roads out here. Uh, I, I was reading our stuff uh, on the Stars website. Three to six inches maybe today fell, and they're expecting a couple more by tomorrow. So about eight or nine inches in Kansas City over the next couple days. So I hope that uh, um, n- n- appreciate everybody joining us here tonight um, on Facebook Live. Let's uh, let's finish it up with some final thoughts. And uh, and then we'll and then we'll get out of here. Um, Melly, what do you what have you got to finish this up? I, I thought they played their their most complete game of the season. Wow. Um, you know, just offense and defense putting it putting it together. At the beginning of the year, the defense was was struggling. The offense was was clicking. Um, and then we we know what's happened since. And I just I, I thought 
offense and defense played really well. Like that, that kind of performance, again, we can nitpick uh, the interception, red zone, stuff like that. But that kind of performance, I think, is good enough to, uh, to get to the Super Bowl. Okay. Herbie, what you got? What Sam said. Okay. Ditto. <laughs> Ditto. Ditto. Okay. Um, I, I'd say about the same thing. Just I'd add that the, the number you guys maybe already went over it earlier, but 26 and 3 now, I guess, uh, Andy Reid against the AFC West since yep. uh, 2015. And um, I think we said this last week, but I, I think this is, you know, ever since the, the bye week, which was just before Thanksgiving or just before the Raiders game, I mean, we're in the stretch run, and the Chiefs have been very impressive in this stretch run. And that's what you want. Okay. Yeah. Um, to me, it, it comes down to a little bit of what I wrote about, but um, in a more general sense, uh, we've, we've found a, a really good strength of the defense. And when you look at the last three weeks, uh, Derek Carr passed for 222 yards against him. Uh, last week, Tom Brady threw like 39 passes and didn't even hit 200. Uh, today, Drew Locke throws the ball 40 times and only throws for 208. So teams cannot figure out a way right now to, to beat the Chiefs in the air. And um, again, I still think teams have to run the ball more, but we found a strength of the Chiefs defense, and they had no strengths on this defense last year. I think you said this earlier that, um, that just the, this was a bad matchup for, for the Broncos, right? It's been a bad matchup for four and a half years now. Uh, nine yeah, straight yeah. victories. You talk about the AFC. That's part of the 26-2 and two record that... Andy Reid has against the AFC West, against the Broncos nine in a row. You know, when the AFL started, the Broncos were horrible in the 1960s, just horrible. They were the worst team in the AFL every year, year after year. And the Chiefs ended up winning like 19 of their first 20 games against the Broncos, and that included an 11-game winning streak. Well, since then, the Broncos have had a winning record. Since the merger, really, the Broncos have had a winning record all time against the Chiefs. But if this keeps up, um, it's you know it's just ridiculous what the, the chief success against this Denver Broncos team that in my years in Kansas City has been the biggest rival for the Chiefs the John Elway teams the Peyton Manning teams and some teams in between I just you know I just remember thinking well this you know Chiefs Broncos Chiefs probably will lose both of those this year and and, uh, and see what all see what else they can beat but they have uh, they have Andy Reid has mastered this Broncos team and uh, and, and that's part of the success, that the, a big part of the success that Chiefs have had in division play. Including saying that uh, Drew Locke, it was unfortunate Drew Locke had to play Benedict Arnold and go, go play for the other team. <laughs> which I, Andy went deep in his uh, uh, play calling there with that one. That, 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 was, uh, that, was, that was fun. <laughs> All right. So, hey, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks to Beth Welsh, who, uh, who pieces this together and and puts all this equipment up and then has to take it down and put it in her car and drive home in the snow. So, Beth, thanks a lot. Thank you, guys, and we'll talk to you again on Thursday from Big O Tires.